It's the 23rd of March, the year is 1923. A quiet night on the beach. Then gunshots pierce the silence. Then shouts from two small gangs of smugglers. A boat on the fjord drifts aimlessly. On board is a stash of smuggled booze and two terrified and beat up police officers. What got the people here in this mess in the first place? Let's explore Norway's era of prohibition. Prohibition has been long remembered past its expiration date. What might be interesting though is that Norway, just like USA, underwent this social experiment over 100 years ago. Also, the politics of prohibition reverberates into the present. Here in Norway, there has been a temporary ban on alcohol sales in pubs and restaurants. It just goes to show that control of the alcohol market and alcohol's use has always been a central dilemma in society. To really understand prohibition, we have to go back to a popular grassroots movement that gained traction all over the English-speaking world and the Scandinavian countries during the 19th century, the temperance movement. This is a huge subject in itself and I possibly can't hope to cover it all. But in Norway too, they formed a successful political lobby and they exerted pressure on the politicians, along with the labor movements and the Christian lodges. Their old enemy, King Alcohol, was blamed for a lot of societal evils. Domestic violence, alcoholism, poverty, waste, wars even, and food shortage. So, in addition to the moral argument against alcohol, preserving grains for food production rather than liquor made a lot of sense. As the brutal battle of the Somme had raged in France, Norway moved to ban alcohol. Christmas 1916 came, and people rushed in panic to the stores to scoop up the last bottles. Norway, in effect, went dry. Prohibition seems to have worked in the first few years. During this period, drunken crime and misdemeanors were drastically reduced. The emergency laws were left in place until after the war was over, when a national referendum was held. And the results were pretty clear-cut. All hope for a relaxation of the emergency laws were dashed. The permanent law of 1921 made all liquor and fortified wine illegal. You weren't allowed to buy it, and you certainly weren't supposed to import it. But in response, a new black market rose up. Foreign merchants and ship owners were keen to sell alcohol in spite of the illegal nature of their business. Smuggling attracted the existing criminal class, white-collar businessmen, as well as the poor, the unemployed, or the simply desperate. Domestic smugglers met up with these merchants on islands or on ships placed just outside territorial waters. The skipper on board is called Pitch. He invites us down into his quarters, but we instead settle on a deal, ship to ship. The sea is rough, and we constantly have to show the two boats apart, with stakes. He wants eight kroners a can, but I haggle him down to six kroners in the end. The crew loads the cans straight into my cargo hold. It holds 150 cans, so I get 100 kroners back on my payment of 1,000. <laughs> The liquor was brought back on fast motorboats or in fishing vessels and hidden in caches on islands or on the mainland. From here, a wide network of agents distributed the wares to the towns. The law was so lax in certain areas that some coastal harbors became reputed smuggler paradises. Stone is the fairest place in Norway, he said. There are also scotty fish and drinking, he said where you can easily find your cute little girlfriends because of our famous prohibition, he said. Police, he said, will not bother you. Everybody here smuggles, he said. The land smugglers jammed their cars full. They had women in the front seat to seem more innocent, and they drove straight into Christiania or the other town centers, careful to avoid scrutiny by the police. <laughs> Prohibition has created an entire new class of criminals, and our criminal underworld lives for a large part of the illegal bootleg trade. 
In the countryside, moonshine or Jimmebrent was going like never before. Spread out over farms and remote areas, these clandestine distilleries were all but impossible to shut down all at once. A major loophole in the law also enabled doctors to prescribe their patients bottles of alcohol. One doctor was accused of having made nearly 49,000 prescriptions for alcohol in one year alone. There was also plenty of other loopholes. You could acquire other kinds of alcohol, denatured spirits, solvents, furniture polish, or cosmetic products such as hair tonic. And some of that stuff was actually drank. But the government eventually tried to close these loopholes. Booze doctors were prosecuted. Hair tonic was mixed up and made poisonous. Customs grew ever more militant and they patrolled the narrower straits of the Oslofjord, equipped with faster engines, cannons and small arms. They formed basically a small patrolling navy. In 1923, customs and police confiscated over 600,000 liters of smuggled booze. But the smugglers weren't backing down. All of this would culminate on a beach somewhere outside of Oslo. So back here at Big Day, it's March, it's 1923, and two gangs are fighting in the night, tooth and nail, for a trove full of smuggled booze. Only this time around, the police are caught in the middle. Two of the rival gang members have run out of the woods and jumped into the boat. And there's a fight going on. They're getting away, but they can't get further, beaten up as they are. And now they're screaming, help, help, we're the police, help. The next day, the outraged press lambasted these lawless gangs, corrupt society and morals. What was going on with Little Norway? Did we suddenly have a new Chicago? Eventually, the master brain behind the operation would come forward. Builder, entrepreneur and professional smuggler Ole Arthur Antonissen. He told the police it was simply all a misunderstanding. He had mistaken the two police officers for a rival gang of thieves. He would spend the next two years of his life not in bars, but behind bars. So, what brought about the end of this era? Well, it's not something as sexy as crime or gangs and violence. It's more about international cooperation and trade deals. You see, Norway at the time based its economy heavily on fish. Large quantities of dried and salted cod went to countries like Portugal, Spain and France. In return, these countries were, now and then, counting on Norway, buying and consuming their products in return. For instance, Norway was eventually committed to import about 400,000 liters of cognac from France and hundreds of thousands, if not millions of liters of fortified wine from Portugal and Spain. This meant that the state had to take a much more active role in the imports and sales of alcohol, which in turn meant the rise of the wine monopoly, which took over the old wine shops and had its own first store opened here in Oslo on January the 18th, 1923. This turned out to be a complete hangover for Norway's politicians, who tried to balance prohibition with the need of their trade partners. What it boiled down to essentially was, it wasn't okay if you imported alcohol yourself, but it was kind of okay if the government did it. And as the years rolled on and things settled down, there was a quiet shift in the public sentiment. In a second referendum of 1926, a majority voted against prohibition. And so the laws were repealed the next year. Now, this didn't actually end smuggling. I mean, the smuggler networks were still supplying booze at a cheaper rate. But, at the very least, ordinary people could start queuing for their uh, spiritus in public. So, what were the consequences of prohibition? Not surprised by the final of the 18th Amendment. Comparatively, Norway seems to have fallen into the same pattern and traps as the other hardline countries. Even if we left the experiment somewhat early, the consequences were, of course, more or less the same. 
The unintentional side effects of these laws were doctors who acted as bartenders, people who drank behind closed doors, and it also had a corrosive effect on the law. The police turned a blind eye to crime and rampant corruption. Even after violent episodes such as the Battle of Big Day, a social acceptance of drinking meant that smuggling could go on forever. But prohibition, for all its faults, would also leave a lasting legacy. It left us the institutions such as the wine monopoly, which Norway still swears by today. And once his criminal days were behind him, Arthur, renamed Arthur Omre, would lead a new and successful career as a crime novelist. He would base his many stories on his smuggler experiences. I've read a few excerpts of his first novel, Smugglers, in this video. I've done the translation myself. I don't know if there is an English version out there somewhere, but if there is, let me know. Finally, these stories of this smuggler era ensure that these places, landscapes and names lived on in folklore and popular culture. Once again, thanks for watching and please subscribe to the channel. Until next time, goodbye or adieu.